If you've interacted with the Halo community at all in recent years, you will very likely be aware of the sprint debate. The original Halo games, like most classic shooters, had only one base movement speed as opposed to modern shooters where a sprint mechanic is generally considered industry standard. What's the deal with these Halo fans anyway? Are they that overweight that seeing running in a game triggers them? No, there's more to it than that. At a cursory glance, it seems as though it's a fairly trivial mechanic. A slight boost in walking speed accompanied by putting down your gun. Half-Life 1 didn't have sprint, but very few people would argue that the addition of sprint in Half-Life 2 destroyed the game balance. So why is it that Halo fans are averse to the idea of sprint as a mechanic? I believe that investigating this can yield some interesting facts about first-person shooter game design and map balance. Halo Combat Evolved through to 3 are largely considered the core identity of the Halo series. They were the three games which established and refined the Halo universe, story, features, themes, and most importantly for the sake of this video, the Halo gameplay. Now that isn't to say there wasn't some kind of design iteration through each new Halo game. The addition of hijacking, jewel wielding, and equipment over the years, as well as tightening of movement to make it less floaty, along with the removal of the health system in favour of no visible display besides shields. All of these things were introduced in new subsequent Halo games that affected the sandbox in noticeable ways. But with each subsequent release, there were fewer new features introduced. The leap from Halo Combat Evolved to Halo 2 is a larger leap than that of Halo 2 to Halo 3. This is because the sandbox design for the Halo series was narrowing down to a formula, a specific set of functions with a refined balance. Halo 3 is, in the eyes of many Halo fans, probably the favourite. The release of ODST only cemented the Halo 3 gameplay and sandbox design as Halo's trademark formula. One must remember that Halo is a multiplayer game. Obviously the campaign is treasured and held in high regard both critically and among the general gaming population, but most of the people playing the game for years to come are there for the multiplayer. In that sense, Halo 3 was also the peak of Halo, in terms of relevance and popularity. It dominated the Xbox number one most played until eventually dethroned years later by Call of Duty. It was Halo Reach that saw the introduction of armor abilities to Halo for the first time. Included among this suite of armor abilities was Sprint. This was the introduction of Sprint to Halo. Halo Reach was of course the last Halo game created by Bungie. A lot of the staff were under what is now referred to in the industry as franchise fatigue. A lot of the scrapped ideas from the previous games were used in Halo Reach, as well as a lot of the ideas they had planned for Destiny. Note the uncanny resemblance between the Halo Reach challenge system and the Destiny bounty system. The original Halos 1, 2 and 3 all built on a formula culminating in Halo 3, which is widely regarded to be the essence of Halo gameplay and balance. Halo Reach was a divergence from this because it was Bungie's last game and they were experimenting with new systems to see how they would pan out. Of course they didn't design the game with competitive play in mind and didn't plan any support for the game. Post-launch support was ultimately managed by 343 as Bungie left Microsoft and began work on Destiny. Personally, I like Halo Reach, but I'm well aware of where it went wrong. Armor abilities, while fun, absolutely ruined the balance of the multiplayer. Sprint introduced many of the issues I'm going to discuss further on. One common complaint was how powerful double melees became as a strategy. Remember, compared to other FPS games, Halo has a relatively high time to kill. Halo Reach still had a pretty good population, but the numbers did drop off quicker for Halo Reach than they did for Halo 3. With Halo 4, the series is in the hands of the new developer, 343 Industries. And what do they do? Of course, they doubled down. Sprint is now a universal mechanic. Every single playable character can now sprint as a base ability. In the multiplayer modes, there was a perk that enabled unlimited sprint. It fundamentally changed the flow of the game and the maps had to be designed to adapt for this different moving speed. The thing is, this change was somewhat uncalled for. Of the mass of Halo fans, you could always find a minority in support of any idea or game mechanic. But within the Halo community, I don't think there is a sizable enough proportion of people calling for Sprint to be a base trait on every character. Keep in mind that the biggest video game rivalry at the time was between Call of Duty and Halo. Many Halo players were resistant to any seemingly Call of Duty features being introduced to the game. The inclusion of Sprint in Halo 4 was, in part, due to market pressure, as well as 343's desire to stamp their own unique mark on Halo. 
Sprint, in some ways, is an expectation for the modern player. It's almost become an industry standard, so when 343 were doing this playtest for Halo 4, one of the things they undoubtedly heard was the phrase, Why can't you run? Halo 4 may have felt a little more familiar to people coming from other games, but it felt a little less like Halo. Halo 4, in appealing to the broader market, killed the golden goose. It traded in a little bit of its Halo identity for a slightly more bland game. It became Halo of Duty. Why would a fan of another game come to Halo to play things that were done better in other games like Call of Duty? If you play Halo, you want Halo. This alienation of the core fanbase absolutely showed in the numbers for the game. Halo 4 had very strong initial sales, slightly better than Reach, but at a far sharper drop off in players. The new fans that 343 were trying to attract quickly moved on to the next game or went back to playing Call of Duty. Many Halo fans went back to playing Halo 3 and Halo Reach. Now keep in mind that Sprint wasn't the only new feature introduced by 343. New armor abilities like Promethean Vision and Shield, hit markers, flinch, creator class loadouts, kill streaks, aka ordnance packages, perks, and perhaps most importantly, colored undersuits. Halo 4, while critically successful, was a mess and decimated the Halo community. People left in droves and never looked back. Truth be told, Halo has never gone back to the heights it used to be at. With Halo 5, you'd think 343 would undo some of the damage they did with Halo 4. Did they end up doing so? Well, yes and no. On the topic of the video, Sprint is back, with a few caveats. Sprint is back as a base ability, this time it's infinite by default. They removed a lot of the Call of Duty features like Creator Class and Kill Streak, I mean, Ordnance Drops. The game now had even starts again. They nerfed Sprint by making it so that your health can't regenerate while sprinting. They also implemented some measures to counter common abuses like double melee, by making it so that you can shoot instantly out of Sprint. If you tried to melee out of Sprint, it would perform a Spartan Charge. Which brings us to the biggest change in Halo 5, Enhanced Mobility. It was a trend around 2015, after the release of Titanfall, to feature enhanced mobility in multiplayer shooters. Call of Duty Black Ops 3 and Advanced Warfare are very notable examples. Beyond Sprint, Halo 5 included Spartan Charge, Ground Pound and Dash as default abilities inherent in every player. You see, in some ways this was a good thing. It was a return to even starts, where every player at the start of the match has the same abilities, which hadn't been the case since Reach, but it was perhaps the most radical change to Halo's movement in the whole series. While they did nerf Sprint, it's kind of an admission that sprinting messes with the balance of the game. Nerfing the power of Sprint doesn't somehow make it a good mechanic, it simply makes it less destructive to the sandbox. If 343 needs to make all these adjustments to Sprint to make it less harmful to the sandbox, why even include it in the first place? What use does it serve when so many changes need to be made to accommodate it? They simply couldn't accept a game without Sprint. What actually is wrong with Sprint anyway? One of the supposed benefits of allowing Sprint is that it speeds up games by allowing players to move faster. Ignoring what speeding up gameplay actually means, or whether speeding up gameplay is even a good thing, does Sprint really allow the player to move faster? On paper? Obviously. You press a button to move quicker, and you're faster than base movement speed. But what effect does this have on map design? Let's take a look at Truth. It's easily the most popular example in the Halo Sprint debate because it has seen iterations through so many games, as Midship in Halo 2 and Heretic in Halo 3. The iterations of the map in Halo 2 and 3 were quite small, but it's been upscaled in Halo 5. You see, the maps have to be scaled up to allow for Sprint. There's this popular video showing that it takes just as long to get to the same point sprinting in 5 as it did in 3, moving at the regular movement speed. To this extent, the benefits of Sprint are really illusory when the maps have to be balanced around it. The difference between Halo 3 and 5 now, are that you can get to the same point at the same speed, but in Halo 3 you have your weapon up and you're ready to fire at any time. Shooting, melee and throwing grenades will not affect your movement speed. In Halo 5, obviously these things will take you out of sprint. This promotes several negative behaviours in the sandbox. For example, in Halo 3 you could fight back while retreating from an attacker, moving the same speed as you. In Halo 5, you have to decide whether to fight or flight, because whoever's doing the shooting isn't able to sprint. The chaser cannot keep up unless they sprint, but when they sprint, they cannot shoot. This can bring battles to a screeching halt and can promote running away from battles, which can significantly extend encounters. 
Another issue that wasn't completely fixed is that of double melees from Reach. These are when you sprint up to someone to get the first melee on them. Even if they melee you back after you get your first melee, you get your second hit before they do, as your animation will finish first. They introduced Spartan Charge to counteract double melees, by making it so you enter into a fixed animation whenever you melee out of sprint. Of course, you could simply counteract this by holding back on the thumbstick briefly. Double melees were less powerful because of this, but they did still happen. Halo is unique in the multiplayer shooter space, in part due to its relatively high time to kill, beaten out only by class-based shooters, which are based on an entirely different sandbox. In Call of Duty, when someone's sprinting at you, it takes only a few shots to kill them. In Halo, it takes a few fractions of a second more to kill them, but that allows them to narrow the distance and get the first melee in. That is the crux of the issue with double melee. Another big change that occurred because of Sprint was the increase in projectile travel times, projectile tracking, reticle stickiness, and bullet magnetism, collectively known as aim assist. They had to be tuned up to account for the increased player movement speed. Already weak weapons like the Needler with slow projectile speed would have become even weaker with movement being quicker, so the projectile tracking, that is how aggressively the Needler projectiles track the enemy, was tuned up alongside projectile speed. Of course, this is balanced for when the character is sprinting, but for base movement, as in when the player is in a gun battle, it becomes significantly more powerful. The increase in bullet magnetism led to more examples of people seemingly being shot around corners. The increased magnetism made the game feel less like Halo and more like, as Chris Raygun points out in this video, laser tag. Increased movement speed combined with more powerful weapons led to many other knock-on effects in the Halo sandbox, the biggest of which is the de-emphasizing of vehicles. You see, vehicles are perhaps the most integral part of Halo. Before the Master Chief, before the Halo ring and the entire story, before the game was even an FPS, Halo had its driving physics. Driving all through the development of Halo has been the through line in the Halo sandbox. Bungie effectively changed everything through development, but it kept the driving physics. Obviously not in the exact same form as it was originally envisioned, but existed as the foundation for Halo's gameplay. Halo is a sandbox game, based on physics and AI and the encounters that emerge from it. In Halo 5, vehicles only really existed because they had to, because it was a Halo game. They were not necessary in the sandbox and were relatively weak. They didn't get you to places that much quicker. Halo 5 sacrificed Halo's vehicle sandbox in a big way and absolutely paid the price for it. This has been a general summary of the common objections to Sprint in the Halo community. It's a bigger design issue than many give it credit for. It's really an interesting case study in game design and a huge knock-on effect that changing slight values and adding minor features can have on a player's experience. I'd like to say a massive thank you for everyone who's made it this far in the video and I urge you to please like and subscribe as well as hitting the bell for notifications if you're interested in more content like this. I put a lot of work into these videos and liking them bumps them up in the algorithm. I make these for the sake of discussion so let me know what you think in the comments. Was I right or wrong? Was there something I missed? Thanks again for watching and goodbye. back. That's what I thought he said. The Prophet of Regret is planning to activate Halo. Are you sure? Hey John was a racist! I call all you African Americans! Don't you dare! Pretty much. Commander, we've got a problem. So I hear.